So, so that was bad timing to open my bottle of water. Um, welcome to the KEW Exchange, where knowledge through experience transforms into wisdom. And tonight we're going to talk about sobriety and sexuality. Jenny Clark. I've gone back and forth with Jenny Clark for a while now, um, at least nine or ten months, and this is going to be an interesting conversation because I'm sober over 14 years, I was at 15, and Jenny's been sober a long time. <laughs> so this is definitely going to be a raw conversation straight from the heart because uh, we have a lot to go into. <laughs> so. Jenny, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit so people that don't know you can know you. Well, Michael, thank you so much for having me on tonight. And I feel like I'm called to have this conversation with you after listening to some of the other ones that you've given, because you're very open about everything you talk about. And that's really what we're looking for. If, if I can admit all my bumps and all my bruises, then there's nothing you can pick at me about. So I'm a lot more free. And I think that's what I, that's all about. So. My name is Jenny Clark. My company is Solvability. I've had it for, since 1997 and my mission is to create a virtual entrepreneurs network for veterans that are in federal contracting that are working in professional services and IT because they hire veterans. And I'm looking all the way around and saying this could actually work. I'm the, uh, the daughter of a military dad. I have four brothers, three of whom were military and the other two of us just ended up in the defense industry somehow. And so I felt like um, when I went through my last process of changes and I moved from Huntsville, Alabama, which is federal city down to Tampa Bay, the first time I walked to in a room with a group of people down there and saw the guys in fatigue, I was like, I didn't know I wasn't home, but I am home now. And that's what we're all searching for. Where do we belong? Who is our tribe? Who do we want to be with? Who do I identify with? And I think that growing up in a military family, it's like the language, the pace, the way you think, there's a lot going on, but there's also some drawbacks to that when we think about it. And those are all the things that we want to be talking about tonight, Michael. Yeah, and, and I think it's more than that, right? Because I think we have multiple tribes and, and I really believe that we have multiple circles. Uh, because we all have different facets of our life and we all have different um, groups that we associate based on what we're looking for at that moment. Right. And, and, and it's not in a negative way. It's not like we, you know, remove people from our group. It's just, you know, like me, I'm a very, very, very spiritual person, like through and through extremely spiritual. And I have my spiritual network and then I have my business network and, you know, I have all these di and different networks and, a lot of times I do merge them together when, when the synergies are there, right? But then there's times that, you know, you kind of just want a little to differentiate yourself and, and feel like you have different homes based on where you're at at that moment because everything is so ever-changing, right? So You absolutely do. And the other side of it is I feel like I'm voracious in wanting to read and learn more. And I was so glad when you started talking about spirituality because – it's really been a journey for me over the last few years of learning more about myself, learning more about the universe and what's really possible. And we've been trained to have so many limitations to believe we fit in this box. And it turns out we're building our own box. A hundred, a hundred percent. There is no box, right? We create our own based on societal norms. And, and when you start realizing the personal freedom of not having a box, and that it doesn't even exist, then it's limitless where we can go, right? And, and, and you know, I, I look at this topic and I look at sobriety and I was sober 14 years before I did any of the emotional work, right? And, and it's the emotional work that brought me back to my spirituality in, in a huge way. Um, and it was just everything at once for me. Like all those years of, you know, jumping around and staying, you know, staying sober, but I was never sober and free. I never felt like I was free. Uh, I never had that, you know, free, free feeling because, you know, I'm, I'm just a rebel, right? I, I never, I don't like authority, which is obviously why I never went to the military. I would have watched out day one because I would have looked at him and said, why? Right. That's just who I am. Um, and, you know, I always was like that, even as a kid, as a kid and, you know, everything I went through in my life, it, it was, you know, whether it was the abuse, whether it was, the schooling and, and everything that I went through, I just fought everything. 
because it just didn't, it, I didn't fit in. I never fit. So, like, I, I mean, how has the spiritual experience, like, shifted your sobriety or shifted you in general? Well, it's really taken me back to those first days when um, I finally made the decision, which, you know, every, every New Year's, I'd say, this is the year I quit drinking. <laughs> and I went through that many years in a time. And so my sobriety date is January 28th, 1991. And what I think back is to the first day that I walked into a meeting to talk about it and how I, tears are streaming down my face. I have a Diet Coke. So that's my like, that's like, this is going to help me. And um, I, I, I felt so uncomfortable, but at the same time, I was so welcomed. And so much of what we learn in sobriety is foundational to things that are really spiritual, but we just didn't know about it. And um, there are certain things that you remember, you remind yourself, there's practices. There's, um, there's the other biggest thing is being able to stop judging yourself and letting go because you're, you can be sober, meaning you're not drinking or you're not taking drugs or whatever that is, but that doesn't mean you're free. Exactly what you talked about. There might be a 12 step program and I could go to four, but after that it was too hard. And you have to go, you have to wait until you're ready for that next part of your journey. Did you find that to be the case too? Well, for me, for me, it was interesting, right? Because at 17, um, I was drunk and I went to my psychiatrist and I swung on him. Right. And he really upset me. And then I swung on the, the glass encasement in the parking garage um, downstairs, shattered glass everywhere. My hand was bleeding. So they ended up Baker acting me for my own safety. Right. And, and what I did was I manipulated them into believing that it was just because I was drunk. Um, so then they put me into a, a rehab and at 17, I was born and ready. Right. But it was cool because I was almost 18. So I was still around people my age, but there was a lot younger kids in there also. But then I was also old enough that the adults would give me cigarettes. So that was fun. Um, so it was like, you know, I was the cool I was the cool guy because I was old enough to hang out with the adults, but young enough to fit in with the the youth, right? Or the minors or whatever you want to call it. And and I didn't absorb anything. I did I stayed sober three months. Uh I didn't absorb it. Uh for me it was a death wish, right? Like I just wanted to die. I wanted to drink or do drugs or coke or ecstasy or anything that I did to such a maximum quantity that I just wanted it to end because being, I always knew I was an empath. I always knew that I was emp uh, empathetic, uh, empathic. Sorry. Uh, I also, you know, I, you know, I'm a healer. I go into all these different areas of my spirituality. Right. And I have all these abilities and because at a young age, I was told it's not possible I always felt different. I always felt like it didn't belong. And I went to psychiatrists, therapists, and, and it was just so much of it, right? And, and all I ended up doing was judging myself, blaming myself, shaming myself. And as I got, went into adulthood, it became this, this, this running theme for me, right? How much can I do to try and end it? And it just never worked. No matter what, it never worked. And, you know, when I was growing up in the 80s, being an extra sensitive you know, white male was not really the norm or something acceptable. So me walking around crying, me walking around sharing my feelings, me being emotional was just not a normal thing. Uh, and again, that's a stigma, just like every other stigma. And it, it was just, it, it was so difficult for me as a kid, just not understanding myself, right? And, and that became my, my diversion, my out from life. Which then, even after being sober, I still found other ways to do it, you know, because I didn't, I didn't do the emotional work. So when the emotions would come back up, I would, I would go into workaholic. I would go into sex, sex addiction. I would go into porn addiction. I would go into gambling addiction. I mean, anything I could be addicted to, I was. As long as I stayed sober, it, was, it wasn't the same thing, right? And, and, and at the end of the day, it was always looking to fill a void that I couldn't fill. Um, and, and that's where I think spirituality came in, in a major yeah. way. Well, you're right. When you're somebody that um, is sensitive to other people around you or whatever it is, we're all looking for a sense of belonging. We want to conform. We don't want to stick out, but we don't want to look like everybody else. We're looking for our own individuality. And um, I feel like what we're also doing is 
we're looking for something that makes us feel better right now. And in, in my day today, it's sugar. <laughs> Chocolate and sugar will make me feel better. And maybe that's my addiction, but it's the same thing with alcohol because when alcohol is so immediate, you know, it's completely acceptable. Nobody's going to question me. I could walk down the street right now and go do whatever I want to. It's a daily choice to decide not to do that. But the difference is that um, alcohol works consistently until it doesn't. Yes. And then what you're talking about is you're you're have you're self medicating to get rid of that feeling of I don't fit in. What am I supposed to be doing? And I think that what you found with the spirituality is there's some other ways that we could handle it. Because so, I could just say, you could be sober and not really be better, right? A hundred percent. And and so here's my question for you, right? You've been sober a long time. And 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 it's and it's not often I say that because I've been sober a long time, right? So, so for somebody to double me in years is a lot. So I, sober, sober, let's not, you know, I'm not aging you, so let's not go there. But um, so... For me, when I was at, when I became to the point that I was unmanageable, right? It was that last probably two years that I was using. Uh, I had a DUI and then I used another three years after that, right? My DUI, I think, was March 4th, uh, 2004, or May, May 4th, I think, 2004. And I stopped drinking. Um, my sobriety date is June 19th, 2006. So it was like a good two year window, but I was so out of control. I couldn't keep a job. I just like, there were days I went without showering, without sleeping. And because I was mixing, right. I was going from Coke to alcohol to Coke to alcohol back and forth. Like, I mean, nobody even noticed because I was just so out of it, like all the time. And, and I felt myself shrinking daily, like just disappearing. Like what was, what was it like for you at those moments? Like at near that end, because I think it's important, especially right now, that people understand that they're not alone if they're in that spot and, and, and that there is hope to get out of that spot. Well, everybody wants to think that the alcoholic's the person under the bridge that's homeless. And that's not really true. And um, for me, what it was is I worked very hard. I had a young family. I did everything I was supposed to do. And so it would get to be eight or nine o'clock and I would have a Sprite with vodka in it. And then I would have one or two and thinking that I'm fooling my husband at the time, which I wasn't, but it was almost like, okay, I got, I did all these things. So now from this time to this time, and it was the constancy of it or that two wasn't enough. And I wasn't, you know, I didn't go out and drink. I didn't drink and drive. I drink at home. And you know, these things, everybody has their rules and that rules are completely made up. But I would say that, um, I, I was able to do everything that I needed to do, but the next morning I would wake up with just a horrible headache and wonder why am I doing this to myself? Why am I doing this to myself? I grew up in a military family and that was part of the way we communicated my military dad and my brothers and everything else. I mean, I wanted to be like them. And so I drank like them because then I thought Jenny's strong, you know, she can do these things. She can drive like us, you know, she may not be able to lift logs like we can, but she's almost as smart as us. And it was always like, I wanted to be accepted and seen and alcohol was an easy way to do it. So, you know, my dad's well, go give me a scotch. Oh, cool. I'll go do that. And it became intriguing. This seems like something I should do. So it, it wasn't always super bad, but I knew at an early age that I drank differently than other people. And it took me a long time to realize, Oh, maybe, that because all my friends drink, I don't say they're not alcoholics because I like hanging out with my friends that drink, Right. for example. And I can remember the day that I just, and I'd gone through these ups and downs, but I had a, a, a day where I'd, I'd had um, family events and I had too much to drink at a family occasion with my young daughters, went back to the house and was um, cooking them something to eat while my husband took the, the, the relatives to the airport. And I realized, Oh my God, what am I carrying down to my children? This stops with me. And I'd been going to therapists. I'd spent all kinds of money on stuff like that, but nobody just said, Jenny, have you looked at this? Have you thought about these? Because our, our um, 
mental health health industry doesn't really talk about alcohol because it's too accepted. It's, you know, it's like you, you've got to discover all this stuff on your own. But it took somebody else telling me, pulling me aside and say, hey, Jenny, I'm going to the AA meeting. Do you want to go? And about 15 times before I was able to make that decision to do it. But the number one thing is this stops with me. And um, it's just like anything else. The only way to, to um, if you're an alcoholic, the only thing you can do is stop drinking. And that may solve the symptoms, but you still got the void. And that's what you've been talking about, Michael, about how you find what fills that void. And, you know, 14 years is a lot to work with. And so when did you start this different journey? I mean, uh, well, okay. So I spiritually woke up the first time at five uh, when something happened. Not exactly sure details. Um, out of body experience died something. I don't know exactly what it was. Um, I remember it vividly. It was way too many details to share live because it's just not appropriate. Um, then again, I really woke up when I was 20, right after I got sober. So 26, 27. So like right after I got sober uh, and I met my first human spiritual guide. Uh, now that backfired in many ways. Um, and I shut down again during my horrible marriage. Um, which neither of us were right for each other. I'm not going to pretend I was right for her either because I wasn't. We got married for the wrong reasons completely. Um, and then this go around was, you know, back in June that I woke up again. And now it's just full speed ahead. And I'm just picking up where I left off and just going light years ahead because I'm doing all the work, right? I'm filling my own voids. You know, I've talked about this many times. For the first time in my life, I said I love myself in September. Like I'm 41 years old. I mean, first 41 years, that, that thing, those words never came out of my mouth. I literally had to pick up the phone and call someone because I didn't believe I said it. Like it was not like it was crazy. So here's a question for you. And I'm curious because what I noticed is even being sober, right? When I would try to fill the void with other things, I ended up at that same dark space. I ended up at that same, that same low, even though it wasn't a drug or an alcohol. I found that same low, right? That same grasping for something that pull me out and and fill that void and lift me back up. And and I'm curious because, you know, when I when I woke up this go around, it was because of Annie, right? I talk about it all the time. And, and when I woke up this go around, is when I finally was willing to do all the work. And yes, I'll explain the work, Emily. Um, we're not giving much time for uh, Jenny to talk, but that's fine. <laughs> um, so the way that it started for me was uh, Annie introduced me to gratitudes, doing gr daily gratitudes and started flipping my mental perspective a little. Then she introduced me to Brene Brown and I did the blame, shame and guilt work. And I really, really got diligent about it. Like, I mean, my fourth step, I think, was three or four or five subject notebooks. But this was like at least 10 notebooks, my blame, shames and guilt. It was ridiculous. Um, and, and it was a recurring theme, right? Because at different ages, we tell ourselves different things that still fall it back into the same original blame, shames, and guilts. Um, and then from there, I went into uh, trauma therapy or trauma, I guess, trauma therapy or trauma release therapy with Sherry Lewick. And she started teaching me how to release my trauma and then also um how to handle my triggers right because that was a big thing learning how to handle my triggers was enormous because that's like a light bulb moment when you realize that you have power over your triggers like everything changes right like it, it just nothing at those moments when you realize that you have that mental control it gives you this inspirational power and, and and you feel, I don't want to say untouchable, because I think that's in the in, in, uh, invincibility complex, um, but it makes you feel your own power, right? You start feeling your own power. Um, so when I look at it, like it was everything. It wasn't just one thing. And I have spiritual guides. I have people in my life. I have physical ones, spiritual ones. Like I have an, like I said, I have a global spiritual network that I work, that I talk to almost daily. Um, and, and I've really built this, this, okay, Sid, you put more marker on your face. Can you not draw on your face, please, Sid? No. No, you're not going to? No. Okay, go in the room, please. I'll bring you apple juice. Sorry. 
you um, said that only one time. I sit there a long, long time because I'm live right now. Sid, we had this conversation. You, you holding cup. I'm holding your cup, so I'm not getting you apple juice. So you're standing right there. This is negotiating with a three-year-old. Why don't they teach us? No, I think this is very important that you're able to be present with your three-year-old. And so while you're getting her apple juice, let me talk a little bit, if I could, about the other side of it. What Michael's talking about is spirituality is figuring out what you need to learn about yourself so you can feel good about yourself. And everybody's got different ways that they want to do it. For some people, it's prayer for meditation. Some people, it's church. Some people, it's... um being with God, some people, some people it's uh, getting a lot of exercise or enjoying biking. But I think the thing for me that really relates back to alcoholism, sobriety and spirituality is first you have to decide with the sobriety that you don't need the alcohol anymore because alcohol is such an instant drug and you can take that out of your life. But does that, does that fill the void and what do you do with it? And the other part about it is, for me, for the longest time, it was enough just not to drink. It was enough just not to drink and just to live my life, not do a lot of um, real soul searching or whatever. Um, so everybody's got to choose their own path and their own timing. And with, um, with finding the path to sobriety or going to spirituality really means, hey, guess what? I have no secrets. I just announced on a national group that I'm an alcoholic. So, you know, say whatever you want to, you can't really embarrass me about being an alcoholic. It's like, okay, well, I don't like orange juice. Maybe whatever the thing is, whatever it is. And what we're talking about really is identifying for each of us, what triggers you in your life. I feel like where I am right now, spirituality wise is I just want to be centered. I don't want to have the events around me have any impact on me. And I've had to do certain things like I quit watching TV for the most part. I um, have definitely studied a lot of books and oh my gosh, we could go down the list of all the books we've read and the impact they've had. One of my favorite ones called Radical Forgiveness uh, by Colin Tipping. And, and it's really all about saying, um, okay, well, I can make a choice every day. What choice do I want to make? And do I try to control other people? Or do I let other people's emotions control mine? And when you can get to the point and say, you know, that's not a choice I would have made, but good on you. Right. Well, Let's let everybody be who they want to be. And, and I've got, and I've got to say, it's not that easy always, right? because when you start getting, when your emotions get involved, it takes you to a different level. Right. And what I'm realizing is that, Every day I'm evolving a little bit more, right? Every day I'm learning more about myself and I'm, a, and I'm evolving and adapting and transforming additionally. And, and, and staying centered, I'm very good at right now on a regular basis. And I do, I meditate many times a day. Um, and even that always doesn't work anymore, right? Because the world is so much chaos around us, right? Like everybody was ready for World War III yesterday, right? And you felt the global tension, right? Like the world was watching to see what was going to go wrong next. And I woke up feeling the global tension. Like I felt the pressure of the world on my shoulders. Um, and, and, and getting centered and staying there is not always easy. Right. And, and it's, and it's, it's actually really a lot of work and you need to want it. Right. And, and I just went through a Jay Shetty's live like a monk, live, live like a monk. Sorry. Um, and it's a long book for an audio. I don't read. So it's audio. Everything I do is audio because I'm an audiological person. Probably why I'm doing a podcast because I love talking. Hate my voice, but I love talking. Um, <laughs> but like it was 11 hours, but it was such a great detailed way of how to bring that monk mentality back to life, right? And how you bring it to the, to the world. And, and it was really a great experience and little tools and tricks. And it, I think like this spirituality and is becoming more mainstream now. And I mean, I guess I'm making, I'm also helping to make it mainstream because I talk about it every day live. Um, I'm not really giving people a choice, but to listen. Um, it, it's, I see where it ties into sobriety, where it ties into the lifestyle is an enormous tie in because, you know, when there were times like I've been sober a long time, I've been through a lot of hell in that time. 
homeless three uh, twice, no, three times, house fires. Many different things have gone wrong in my life. Businesses implode. I had to fire all my employees overnight, like many different issues that people look at me and say, how did you not go back? And my only answer is my higher power, right? Like, because I was still trying to fill voids. I was still empty inside. Um, like, how do you, how do you handle when the world is just spitting at you and throwing stuff at you and, and trying to just pound you? I mean, how do you, where do you, where do you go for that? Like my refuge is meditation. It doesn't always work. It just doesn't. <laughs> well, uh, think- when you were saying that, I was thinking of there, but for the grace of God, go I. And everybody needs to find their own ha- higher source, whether it's whatever they want to call it, universe, spirituality, God, whatever you choose to do it. it and it's OK for everyone to choose their own. Um, for me, honestly, when I get overwhelmed, I sleep. <laughs> I just well, go say, I think it's a good time for me to go read a book for a little while and take a nap. And that's my reset. Um, I do know it makes a big difference when I go out and get exercise or whatever, but we've been going through this COVID for the longest time. It's like every time I go out, I'm like, am I getting something? Am I going to do, do something else? So it's um, everybody needs to find their own thing. But I've, I have uh, somebody suggested the other day that I create a battle rhythm. Because every time we do something, we all want to improve from wherever we are. And so a battle rhythm, I made a list. I use crayons because when I use crayons, I'm feeling creative. And I made a list of what my sequence was going to be. And I might not go through that every day, but I look at it and think about possibly doing it. And I don't judge myself for it not working. And I think that's really what spirituality is about is accepting yourself with all of your feelings and, and everything and realizing that we should be observing our feelings and say, hmm, wonder why I feel that way. Wonder why I get so upset when I'm out on match and somebody deletes me. I don't even know that person. Why should I care? Right? Well, and, and okay. So I think there's many things to say there. I'm a single father of three, 1200 miles from anybody. So sleeping isn't always an option for me. Right. Unless I start throwing furniture in front of the front door and, and scotch tape and glue all the drawers closed, which doesn't happen. <clears throat> but like, for me, my only refuge is meditation. Like I, I have to be present while also trying to squeeze in my time. And like Kelly knows me, our producer, right? And she knows me so well. Like there's been times I've been so overwhelmed with the three kids that I lock myself in the bathroom because it's the only place in the house with locks on both sides. And I just put on my noise canceling headphones and I just drown it out and just meditate because at those moments, it's the only way I can handle it sometimes. Like it's that overwhelming feeling. Exercise is great. But again, with three kids, I can't just go for a walk. I mean, I could try taking three kids, including my three year old, but um, that doesn't always work out well because that sometimes is more stressful than <laughs> just dealing with the situation. Um you know, it, it's I. what I really think it is, is everybody's got to listen to enough different ways that they find what works for them. And, and it's so important to always learn, like you said, like go through books, go through other people's experiences, listen to these types of conversations, because just because one part of what you said resonates, one part of what I said resonates doesn't mean that they can't build their own way of doing it. Right. Like it, it's everybody's got to find their own their own combination of ways to do it. And and I think that's really important. You've got a really good point about that, Michael, where um, everybody's got to find their own path because we're having this conversation. It's a unique conversation that only the two of us could have because we're the ones that have this life experience. And people sometimes don't appreciate their own life experience and realizing what works for them. And when I'm, talking to people about what do they want to try. So, well, what'd you like doing as a kid? Cause when you were six, five, six, and seven, you didn't really have rules. You knew enough about the world to have fun and you should release yourself from duty and have fun doing something like that. Um, I also understand how so difficult it is for people during this time that have children and children at home, because you're the only person that they can rely on. And all I can think of is, just put more love out there, more hugs. I don't know, because 
<laughs> your children are looking for you. This is true as a parent, no matter what. They're looking to you for guidance. They're looking to you for attention. And you as a child, we're looking for the same thing from your parent or whoever was significant in your, your life. And so acknowledging other people, I think is really important right now. We are so isolated and it's so much easier for me to say, you know, I'm just not going to worry about the rest of the world. I'm just going to take care of me. And that's not really what we want to do either. This gives us a way that we can communicate with people and kind of share our story and talk to them and say, take whatever you get from it, develop your own path because everybody's got to find out what their thing is. Some people say that what we're going through is really learning lessons that as soon as I learn the lesson, it will quit happening to me. And I'm like, could somebody please just tell me what the lesson is? I just need it right now. Do you ever feel that way? Yes, uh, very, very often, very, very often. Um, I, I think a lot of it is that allowing, right? Allowing, and accepting, allowing, and releasing. And, and and that's something I learned from Sherry Lewick and I've transferred into my own thought process because for me, I break it down mind, heart, and soul, right? Like there's three levels of who I am as everything that I am as a human being. And for me, accepting is the mental part, allowing is the emotional part and releasing is my soul part. So that's how I process those things. And when it comes to lessons, nobody repeats lessons more than me because I'm really stubborn. Um, well, I thought I was the most stubborn person I know until recently. Um, and like, it's, it's interesting, right? Because the funny part is when we finally get let go of these lessons, they disappear. And I don't know if it's as much as the lesson disappears or how it impacts us disappears. Right. And I think that's the real key is to, is to not allow it to impact us. And, and I'm not good at that. I'm really not, I'm not good at that at all. Um, because I'm such an emotional person, an emotional being, right? And I'm living this human experience as a spiritual being. So, like, I'm constantly in a tug of war, right? Because I want to be spiritual, but then I'm also human. And, and and I'm like, my spiritual side says one thing, my emotional side says another. And my mind, I mean, I'm just so over-analytical. I just tear myself, I just tear things to shreds. So it, it's at some point I need to quiet it all. And that's well, I think where you're really right about quieting your mind. That to me is the first step when I can um, just close my eyes and stop thinking for a while. And then, you know, when you first try to do it, you say, well, stop thinking. Now I'm thinking about stopping thinking. And now I'm thinking about the grocery store and what else I have to do today and phone calls. And we're so tied up into our day to day routine and what we have to do. We're effectively programmed all these things that you do naturally. And so it's almost like you have to first recognize that I don't want to do it that way anymore. And then say, I'm going to do the exact opposite of that. Cause that's the only way you can turn yourself around and break free. And it's, and it's funny that you're saying that because recently with my gratitudes and daily that I do, I've reversed them quite a bit and I call it reverse gratitudes just because that's my mind being over analytical and has to name everything. Um, so what I've been doing is the next, I, the next morning I write down my lessons from the day before and, and then I reverse it into the positives of what I've learned from those lessons. Right. And what I'm taking away from it. And, and what it's doing is it's making me grateful for the shit. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, um, you know, it's one of those things that like, if you can be grateful for the shit, everything else is so much better. Everything else is so much better. Like it just gets easy. And, and, well, and it's, it goes back to acceptance, right? A hundred percent. And I think you use the word allowing acceptance and release. Yes. Accepting. And allowing. So, that's um, allowing is seeing what you've got and saying, Oh, that's interesting. And not having a, not trying to interfere with it. Just let, let, let's see what it is. And accepting to me is, um, just realizing, well, this is happening. I'm not sure why it's happening to me now. Kind of wish it wasn't, but where's the lesson for me and where can I be? And release, that also has a lot to do with forgiveness and forgiving ourselves. Self-forgiveness always goes back to self, right? I mean, the more you talk about, can you love anyone else? You need to love yourself first. Uh, the more you talk about, you know, can you forgive anyone else? You need to forgive yourself first. 
when you talk about, you know, how um, judging, right, self-judgment versus judging others, like expectations, right, and all those things start with self. Because if you can not do any of those towards yourself, you then have the ability not to do it towards another. And, and if you don't have the ability to do those things towards another, then you're definitely judging yourself or any of those things on yourself at somewhere along the line. And, and, and you, you really have to look inward, right? And, and every human being that we meet in our life is a mirror of us. In some way, we see something in them that we either don't like about ourselves, that we love about ourselves and just don't recognize and and this whole appreciating ourselves is is really interesting. And, and I'll go on a little tangent real quick. Like I'm starting this consulting business um, because I spend a lot of my time helping others. I really do. And I spend a lot of my time, you know, really just talking to people and helping them get through either business stuff or personal stuff or spiritual stuff and helping them, you know, see their best selves. So I've decided to turn this into a consulting business because I'm stranded in nowhere and I've got to make money somehow. So uh, single data three. So, you know, it's not like I have all the time in the world. And, and, and I didn't, I like, I couldn't articulate what I bring to the table. So I'm sitting here and I'm writing my one pager that like uh, four or five days ago. And, I, and it was horrible. It was horrendous because I couldn't articulate what I bring to the table. So I reached out to somewhere between 20 and 40 people that I know that I've spoken to since December 1st that said that I had an impact on them. And I asked them, you know, what's four words or a little sentence about how I helped you? It was so overwhelming. I mean, I literally cried about it that night. I cried about it the next day. Like, I couldn't believe that that's what I was doing for people. And, and it was it was really eye-opening for myself. And then what I did in turn was I finally processed it four days later. And, and it inspired me to write a real one-pager. And, and, and now I'm able to articulate what I bring to the table. What are your four words? Oh, there was there was probably a total of 50 or 60 or 70. Like a lot of people repeated some like inspirational, motivational, um, intuitive, uh, supportive, um, loving. Like, I mean, there's lots of different words that were, that were repeated. I mean, but, you know, showing me my best self, you know, like lots of people said that too and and seeing what I didn't see and stuff like that. And it was really just overwhelming, right? Like if you really think about the impact that you have on every human being that you meet on a daily basis and we don't appreciate ourselves for that ever. We really Well, don't. and what you've done is you've created a deeper connection and you listened. And 100%. I feel like that's what people are looking for right now. That we're having a lot more one-on-one -on -one connection, even though we're sitting in front of a screen. Um, people are a little bit more open up because, like, you can see where you live, you can see that you know who else is in your family, what you're what you're about, and it's really like showing up without our uniforms, without our masks, and it's been so freeing. And what's amazing to me is thinking about how the world has changed for the better despite this really difficult period of time. Um, what are we valuing differently? What will we value in the future? And um, I think that people have learned that they can be whatever they want to. And what you're talking about is you discovered your gifts mm -hmm. and you started to say, these were gifts that I came to the, came here with and I should treasure them and share them instead of hiding them on a rock because I'm not sure how to monetize that. You just yeah. say, I'm going to get out there. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about being open and what you, what people need to do because we're looking for a human connection. We're looking for somebody to accept us, to say, Michael, I like you just the way you are. Had right. I not gone out on LinkedIn, I would never have met Michael. And in the past, I feel like what I would do is I would read things and say, well, I don't agree with that. And it was basically based on who I thought they were, which mm -hmm. was who I thought I was. And if we could get rid of all that, we could have a much more open world because your, your calls have really opened up my world to a lot of other people that I wouldn't have encountered. And I feel like, oh my gosh, there are people that think like I do. I'm not alone. 
right. that's really the biggest piece of it. But everybody that I associate with is driven. They care about people. They want to be connected. They want to do more, but they're also, we're a bit frazzled. We're doing too much. We're taking on too much. And somebody will call me and say, you should do this. I'm like, I should totally do that. I get real excited, but I don't take the other stuff out. So all I've done is overloaded myself. What we're learning to do and that we have to do better is make choices and just say, I call it letting go of the rope. You know how Tarzan would swing from tree to tree. He would let go of the rope. And there was a point in time where he's not touching anything. How do we let go of the rope, Michael? So see, here's the thing, right? We love, we love our comfortable norms. Okay. So what I've learned is through this journey over the last seven, eight months um, is if I'm not uncomfortable, I'm doing something wrong. And if I'm not being vulnerable, then I'm not being true to myself. If I'm not walking in my core values, then I can't continue doing whatever I was doing at that moment. For me, it's the only way that I can live and be my best self. It doesn't mean every day is great, right? Because bad days, I'm still my best self. The key to those days is just lack of self-judgment and self-forgiveness, right? And self-compassion. So it, when I look at, you know, how do we let go of the rope? We just do. You, you just stop holding on to it. You stop holding on to what's always worked for you because really at the end, it doesn't work. You need to find your new self and you need to walk into that. And it is hard and painful and painful because you've got to walk through shit to get to the light. You really do. <laughs> you, you've got to go through it. You can't go around it. Well, luckily there are some tools and there's a lot of them. And I see, it seems like I'm always taking a test or something like that. And I always want somebody, could you just hand me a test? Cause I'm really good at tests. Yeah. And and then I realized, well, this is no different than taking a test to the back of Cosmopolitan magazine or something like that to find your ideal man. It's right. not going to work that way. You've got to decide for yourself what's important. And you mentioned the word core values. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's one, bit, one of the things that has really helped me the most. You know, I knew I was patriotic. Is that a core value? Mm, I don't know. But I, I created some core values just for this year. I might shift a little bit. I might change them around. But right now it stands for Mitch, M-I-T-C-H. It's mentorship, inclusion, teamwork, camaraderie, and heart. That's because the... everything I do falls into those categories of what can I do to help somebody move along? Um, how do I make sure that I'm open to other people? how do I make it easy for people to work with me? Because it's really a lot easier to do it my own way. Um, camaraderie is I want to have fun with this. I want to have joy in my life every day and I work a lot. So I've got to have joyful work. And then heart to me is really everything for me is about family and what really matters and having connections with people. And if I can, if I can work on those, that makes me feel like I've stuck to what I needed to today. Right. Well, yeah, and because I'm so analytical, I decided to get creative and break it down into categories and subcategories. And, like, I have this extensive list because I need really fin finite details for me. Like, I broke it down to mental mental core values, emotional core values, spiritual core values, and then what I look for in anybody in my life, right? And it doesn't mean one person has to fill them all. It just means that somebody has to fit into one of these to be part of my closest people in my life and clear communication, transparency, um, guiding others. Um, I can't even think of them right now. I mean, constant, continual learning, continuous learning, always evolving. You know what that sounds like? Hmm. The balance um, wheel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every at the beginning of every year, when I was deciding whether I was going to, this is the year I'm going to quit drinking or not. I'd see somebody would give me that balance wheel and they say, well, Jenny, it's just an issue of time management. It's not, it's an issue of mindset. It's an issue of how you understand yourself and what you want to do and what you choose to have is important to you. But I can remember every time somebody would slap up that balance wheel and I would look and it would have spirituality. It would have family. It would have education. It would have work and things like that. I would always look at it and go, I can't do any of that. I have to work in order to have the money to do X. 
And somehow we've got to let go of that feeling that money is the key to all of this. I, I think money has nothing to do with anything. I think money is a farce. No matter how much you make, you never have enough because your lifestyle increases with it. I think that happiness is the answer and money follows happiness uh, or financial security, I should say, right? Because it's not about the money. It's about the financial security. Right. Uh, and, and again, I mean, it's pictures with dead guys' faces on it. I, I'm sorry, but Monopoly had those too. At the end of the day, it's not about that, right? It's not about, we all want financial security. We all strive for that. But what really is that? If you have a mindset that you're in a great place, it doesn't matter what your financial situation is. Plus, great things get attracted to you when you're in a great place. You know, I talk to a shaman every two weeks. He's in Europe. And, and me and him have these hour-long conversations where we just laugh at each other. Like, that's all we do. And, and he said to me, he goes, what is your ideal place? And I said, anyone right here? And he goes, well, that's not real. So what's your ideal place? And I started describing it to him. And he said, okay, so now that you're in your ideal place, what does it feel like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like? What, what do you have there? And he goes, if you stay there, if you bring things in your life that bring you back to that place, everything else falls in place. And, and he puts it pretty brutal for me because, you know, I'm a pretty blunt guy. Blunt is one of the things, too. He goes, just be lazy already. Like you rust, you're such a hustler and you work so hard at everything. Just be lazy. Just sit back and allow it to work out. You've put the energy out there. You have the right intentions. You're doing the right things. Allow it to happen for you. Stop pushing the next thing before you allow the first thing. And that's what I realized I've been doing so much of my life. I've spent so much energy of my own trying to push the next thing that I've missed the current thing. And I've missed so many moments in my life because I spent so much time trying to control outcomes. And it was such a, such a difficult thing, you know? And the one thing that I am looking forward to when this is over is that I see more people than cows on a daily basis. Because I really, miss, thing to want. I really miss people. Like I don't want to be an hour and a half from a Starbucks ever again. Not well, necessarily Starbucks, but just because in general, like being an hour and a half from Starbucks is a bad sign. Everything you were just talking about is about being in flow mm -hmm. and being centered. And I can remember people explaining to me what being in flow was. And I'd say, well, I could just get there faster. <laughs> and I think it was my friend, Emily Harmon, that talked <laughs> about, I don't have time to meditate. I need to meditate faster. And I feel that way a lot. I'll listen to audiobooks at 2X or whatever. <laughs> You've got to slow down and let yourself go. And it's like we've conditioned ourselves. We've trained ourselves. We've been categorizing ourselves that we should measure ourselves based on our tasks and our achievements. And if there we're not achieving, then we're failing. When in fact, what we should be doing is just let it be, let it go where it needs to go. The other thing I feel like when you were talking about this perfect, happy place you've got is for me, it's a home on a bike trail here in the Atlanta area. It's going to have, I'm going to go down to the garage. My bike's going to be in the garage. All I've got to do is open the garage door and ride down to the trail, not crossing any streets, no intersections, nothing. And I can ride 20 or so miles, get my exercise in for the day, listen to a podcast, learn stuff, whatever it turns out to be. That's what being in flow is, but we don't, choose to be in flow because we're always fighting against it. We're always paddling up river. And it's also about putting yourself in a point where you can say, you know, here's my calendar for the week. I am the only one that controls my calendar. Now, if I want to get mad that I'm on phone calls till eight or nine o'clock at night, whose fault is that? But I'll tell you, Michael, I made the exception for you because this has been so much fun exploring what we're talking about, because I think what we both want is for everybody to find what makes them happy and quit judging themselves against that. So they can just say, this is where I, this is what makes me happy because if I'm happy, I'm spreading happiness. If you're happy, 
you're able to take wonderful care of those three children and you can just enjoy that because what we're, we're so busy doing that we're not being in the present moment. Uh, you know, one day when your daughter is not three, but 13, you remember how funny it was when she'd come and ask you for apple juice. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? I'm finally getting there a, a little bit, right? Like much more than I am now. Like I yelled at them earlier today, but that, you know, that we all have our moments. But what I realize is it's also letting go of the things that control us, that we allow to control us, right? Like any of my vices over time that would I'd use to fill voids, when I started relinquishing the control that they had over me, I started finding my personal freedom again. Right. And and I don't just sit here and scroll all day on LinkedIn. I barely promote our lives at all because I just it's just not who I am anymore. I'm not that person that sits there twenty hours a day on, on LinkedIn and and wants to, you know, comment a hundred times in a in a day. And you know, I did that for so long. For t- over a decade I did that. And, and it's one of the reasons I have such a great network and powerful network and a connected, deeply connected network. But it also was destroying me at the same time. And yes, James, being weird. I love being weird. I I absolutely adore being weird. I am so happy to be different. I am so happy to just be me. I don't ever want to be anyone else anymore. I truly am just happy being me. But it took a lot of work to get here. And, And it's no joke. And you need to want it. You need to be willing to go through it. And, and that's part of the reason that I wanted this topic, because it's not only about the sobriety, it's not only about the spirituality, but it's about all the pieces that we did to get here, right? Like, and it's about giving others hope and showing them a way and giving them a path to emulate if they choose, right? Because this isn't something that somebody can choose for you. It just doesn't exist. You have to choose it for yourself. And we can try and push others down a path. We can try and show other, we can try and help others down a path. But at the end of the day, if they don't want it for themselves, it's not going to go anywhere. And and I forget that daily, right? Because I just want to help so many people. And, and I love everyone. And I love humanity as screwed up as it is. And I hate politics, but I love humanity. Um, <laughs> but it's like, you know, I, I just, I want to help people. But sometimes I got to realize I have to let that go. And I have to remove myself from this situation because at some point I start enabling. And at some point I, I do more harm than good. And that is a hard thing to realize for ourselves because our intentions are so pure, but it's just the best thing to do for ourselves and for that other and for others. Right. So well, you're right about that, Michael, in terms of letting everybody find what they want And, but also when they, when they say, what resources could I use sharing the books you've read or the podcast you listen to, or the different journeys, I watch a a lot of YouTube, um, a lot of that stuff. And the other thing is I had to say, well, I guess I could stop watching as much Netflix if I want to have some time to do this. And, um, you know, you don't have to do it every day. You don't have to do it for hours a day. You just have to make it a regular practice, just like brushing your teeth or washing your, whatever those things are. But giving that gives you a little bit of space because you're honoring that in yourself. You're saying, I value myself enough now to say, when I'm getting worked up, I'm just going to go walk in another room for a while. Or I'm going to go take a walk outside. I'm going to do something else. The other thing is we want to be sure that we're spreading positive energy to other people not negative. And you think about this all the time, you know, um, you can be on a conversation and you start to say, well, I have authority, so you should do these things. And like, well, that was stupid. Why don't I say, hey, what's your name? What's going on today? Um, hey, I've got, I've got this big problem and I really need some help. Here's what it is. They're going to be a lot more open to helping you than they are if you made them feel bad about themselves or made them feel like, they're, um, you know, that they don't know something because you decided to kind of power it over them. Well, and for me, right, because I'm audiological, it's a little bit more, I need, okay, so I do a lot of journaling, but I have to, I have to soundboard it out first. 
because I'm audiological. I've listened to audiobooks so much. I listened to Daring Greatly by Brene Brown, I think, 11 times now. Just like, you know, I learn something new every time because I'm a passive listener and I can basically sleep and still learn something. Um, I did it through all through school, so I proved it. Um, <clears throat> I didn't do homework, but, you know, that's a different story. Um, you know, it's it goes back to when you're dealing with another human being on any level, no matter where they are, you have to meet them where they're at. And the more, the closer the person is to you, the harder I find that to do for myself because it, it, it gets entangled for me and, and it becomes very difficult at some point for me not to involve my emotions and entangle them. And then because I'm empathic as well, it, it just, it gets so twisted for me sometimes and I have to step out. I have to just walk away and, and introduce somebody that I trust in my inner circle to, to help a person instead or, or, or just back off because after a while, I see that it starts deteriorating away at me and I can't help others and be there for others if I'm not taking care of myself. That's a really good point, Michael. The other thing that it makes me think of is that sometimes what I do is just I, I just want to say, I know you're going to work that out. And and let people know that they have the answer. There was something that I that um somebody sent me the other day. It sounded like something that came out of a fortune cookie, but it's kind of wisdom that popped up this morning. It said, when a problem comes your way, it is an indication that you have the wisdom to solve it. And we always think, oh, gosh, this is a giant problem. I don't know how to solve this. And then we start working it. We work it, work it, work it. But I, I feel like the thing is to um, what meditation helps you do is shut off and listen to an inner voice or or the wisdom will come. And I don't know, for, for me, a lot of times it's that I'll sleep and then the morning I have the answer. And if I look for the answer, it won't be there. But if I just let it be, it'll come to me. And that's really what we're talking about with everybody, whether spirituality or sobriety is allow yourself to be yourself and make your own choices, make yourself happy. And as long as you're spreading the positive in the world, you're, you're going to be on the right path and you're going to keep moving forward. The other thing I think is so important is basically asking people to continue to up your game. Make sure that you're surrounding yourself with people that are positive for you that you can challenge you to do better because otherwise you're always with the people that are saying, well, I don't know why you're doing that. Jen. That sounds like a lot of work because I could be talking to that immediately. That is a lot of work. I don't think I should do it. you got to find a way you've got to find a way that works for you. And um, I don't know if you know, John Lee Dumas that has entrepreneur on fire podcast, but I can remember listening to his, he was one of the early podcasters. And he talked about getting up at 4 a.m., taking a cold shower. I tried doing that. It did not work for me. No. no. It wasn't I, I think, for me. So we're always looking for, if I just listen to one more podcast, or I just listen to one more book, or I just do this, or I hire a shaman, or I do these things, I'm going to have the answer. The answer's within you. And stopping and saying, it may take a while, but it's going to come to me. Well, but I also think it's surrounding yourself with the right people, right? Like one of the things that I do best is listen, actively listen, and be able to give people insight into themselves based on what they're talking about. Because sometimes you need somebody to clear the cobwebs out of the way, right? Because sometimes we have so much noise that we can't even slow ourselves down. And, I, and I've been in that situation many times trying to meditate, but I also know that I'm audiological and that I need the sounding boards. Now, it comes off as complaining because... You know, I was labeled a complainer and there's a shame and a blame tied to that, I promise, in many ways. Um, and lots of guilt. So I guess it covers all of them for Brene. Thanks, Brene. Um, thank you for labeling that for me. Uh, but, it, you know, for me, I just need somebody to listen as I talk myself through it. I don't always need the input, but I need somebody to at least be there to hear it. Right. But what I do best for others is I listen to their words and I listen to where they're at. And then I tell them back in their own words so that it syncs with them, you know, what they're not seeing for themselves in the clutter. 
And, and, and it truly is a skill to be an active listener. And, and, and we all need to work on that because that is so important in life. You can't judge the, the whole conversation based on the words out of someone's mouth. You need to really feel what they're trying to communicate. And, and it's very difficult. It really is. And then the last thing I'll say about that is happiness isn't that instant gratification. Happiness is the long lasting internal happiness, right? Because we all went for that instant gratification at one point or another in different ways. And it left us more empty than we started. And, and it's a painful, torturous process. And I've put myself through it over 41 years, many times, and it never worked. And, you know, it, I'm glad where I, I'm so excited to be where I'm at today. And I'm so grateful for everything that I've experienced to get where I'm at today. And it also gives me the experience to got, help others understand what I did to get through it. And, and I think that is a gift. Well, you're right. Um, it's a gift of gratitude to recognize where you've been and where you're going and the ability to help others find that same path. And the listening part is the most important because there's so often where we're having a conversation, but we're not listening. And I have a bad habit when people give me directions. I've asked them for directions. They give me the directions, but I'm not listening. And so that's been an example of something you have to overcome. And um, I think that what you're also talking about is if we were having a conversation, you kind of repeated it back to me. I would feel like, well, I didn't say it right or I didn't explain it right. It draws me out and lets me send it, say it a different way. The other thing that I found that's pretty useful is say, wonder why you think that way. Not in a challenging way, but to let them say, that's an interesting way to think of it. So you're not adding a judgment to it. Um, the other thing I find really helpful is just kind of turn it around and say, well, why is that a problem? Or um, what would you do differently if you could? And, you know, I also like the one, if I had a magic wand, because boy, I could use some magic wands these days. Couldn't you? Yes, I would add more people around me instead of cows. That would be the first thing. Well, Starbucks, actually. I'd move a Starbucks here. But after that, yes, people then cows. People instead of cows. <laughs> it's, um, you know, magic wands. I think we all have our own magic wands. We just got to believe that we do. We all have our own abilities and gifts and brilliance and deep down internal brilliance. We just have to allow ourselves to see it and believe it. And it really comes down to self-worth and, and believing in ourselves. And, and and at the core of all this, that's where it comes from. It's that deep down faith, faith in yourself, faith in your higher power, faith in everything around you and what you believe in and what your purpose is. And and it, and it really has to be that deep rooted in yourself before you can have it with anything else. I know we're running over on time, um, but I just uh, I wanted to definitely continue this because this is just awesome. And we'll definitely have to do this again as well, because this is a great conversation. Well, I would love to um, have this some more because I could talk all day about it. But if we were going to do it, what I'd also want to do is um, talk about maybe some books that really helped us. Because I think that's really the simplest way for people to feel like they're on a new path. And you mentioned Brene Brown several times. I love Brene Brown and what her discussions are. I listen to her a lot, her Texas accent on um, Audible. And I've just found that to be so inspirational. Another one I really like is um, Malcolm Gladwell, Talking to Strangers is his latest book. And it questions our assumptions. And that's where we need to be now is really kind of questioning, what are we doing? Why do we do that? And do we have to do it that way? Because we probably don't. If there's a chime to make change in our lives, it is now. 2020 Holy. was a complete, I had no control over that. 2021, let's choose a path knowing that things have changed because there's a new set of rules. So why don't I just go with the rules that I choose for myself? So, Michael, I've really appreciated you having me on tonight. And I really look forward to seeing what you're going to keep doing with your uh, knowledge, experience and wisdom, because I'm feeling that from you right now. It, it's, it's been an honor to share space with you. And tomorrow is going to be fun because I have uh, Andrea Cajomi Summers and Andrea Sanchez talking about a spiritual awakening. 
So that's going to be that's going to be interesting taking that to prime time because we're doing seven p.m. eight p.m. Eastern again. So I don't know how I'm staying up so late, but that's okay. But I'm looking forward to it, and I'm excited. This is, you know, this is a um, this is important. These are important topics right now, and these need to be discussed at a depth that others can be inspired because there's so much despair that we need to share hope. And, and I think that's where this comes from. So again, Jenny, I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Uh, everybody who's been in the comments, thank you so much. I love you guys. And everyone who watches it later, thank you. I, I hope you get something from this. And if you ever need anything, please reach out. And everybody have an amazing night. Jenny, stay right there.